Okay, today we have a brand new guest, Gregor De Brule, Executive Director of Children's Treehouse Foundation. He's brought to us a conversation about generating revenue with your programming, in particular, licensing nonprofit programs. So hang in there because we're going to hear from Gregor in just a few moments. Before we hand it over, we want to remind all of our viewers and listeners who we are. If we've not met you in our previous thousand episodes, today is 1001. So thank you for those that celebrated with us yesterday. Julia Patrick is here. She is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. We are so very honored to have the ongoing support, investment, belief uh, in with these, with these amazing partners. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy, National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, thank you to these companies. Many of them have been with us from the very, very beginning, March of 2020. So thank you so very much. Uh, we also want to say, hey, if you've missed any of our previous episodes or you want to go back and listen to the information that Gregor is about to share, we are recording and you can find them here. You can scan that QR code, download the app, and you can find us on broadcast and podcast channels. Okay, Gregor, my friend, that is it for the housekeeping. Now is when we pass it over to you, but I would like to reintroduce you um, and, and welcome you back again. Gregor DeBrul, Executive Director, Children's Treehouse Foundation. Welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, first things first, congratulations on the thousand episodes. Uh, you know, if you were sort of late to the party like I was, you know, being able to go back through the archive and see the quality of the guests and the wealth of knowledge is just astounding so yeah it's it's okay. such a great resource so congratulations on on uh, hitting a thousand uh, as you mentioned i i'm the executive director of an organization called the children's treehouse foundation uh, we're a cancer support nonprofit and uh you know what we do is we provide uh we provide support programming uh for hospitals to run to help uh parents and kids when when the parent has been diagnosed with cancer so it's very. It can be very traumatic uh, for for the family. The you know obviously a cancer diagnosis affects the entire family, uh, and so we help. Uh, you know we help those families build uh, communication and develop positive coping strategies. And and to do that, we partner with hospitals. Wow, that is an amazing, and um, incredibly august mission, and and pretty. Um, it kind of makes me gulp because I I think wow. You, you know, you think about the patient and that's one thing, but then going through and looking at all the family members, especially children that can't process um, things as the parents do, what an incredible thing. How, how long have you been in, has the organization been in service and in talking about that mission? Has that always been the mission to focus yeah, on? Yeah, that's always kids? been the mission from day one. Okay. The organization has been around for about 23 years. Uh, I've been running it uh, for just under two years now. Okay. Um, and it's always been that. That's always been our mission is, is helping, uh, you know, children and families. Uh, you know, it, it, as I said, it's a, it, well, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of research into, into you know, the, the need for more comprehensive approach to cancer care, a, a more comprehensive approach to cancer care. And a lot of that comes down to looking at the patient as an individual. What are the sources of stress? Uh, what are the, what are the big, um, issues in that patient's life. And if you're a parent, you know, uh, your the welfare of your child and, um, and, you know, your family unit is, is, is just about the most important thing. You know, we routinely hear, I'm more concerned about what's going to happen to my child or how do I talk to my child about this than I am with my own welfare or my own survival. So, um, you know, if we can help those patients, uh, if we can help those patients, uh, by helping their family and by helping their children, we are helping them with their own, uh, you know, cancer treatment. It, yeah, I've been there and I understand. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's intense. Part of the thing that we're going to talk about today, and I think Jarrett and I are so interested in this, is climb children's lives, including include moments of bravery. And if you can explain this program first, then we'll go into the navigation of the licensing. But I really want to get educated on what this looks like. 
Yeah, so CLIMB, uh, you know, the Children's Treehouse Foundation really exists for one purpose, and that's to develop and steward and, uh, you know, spread our program, CLIMB. Uh, you know, that's we have one program that we do, uh, and, and, and it's CLIMB. So CLIMB is a six-week art-based, uh, evidence-based program uh, that's, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's run in hospitals. It's also run online. We run the program online ourselves uh, roughly every eight weeks. Um, and, you know, it's it's uh, designed to have a children's component, uh, a parent's component, a teen component. Uh, during those groups, the, you know, the, the the parents will meet with other parents who are going through uh, you know, sharing this experience. The children are meeting in a group of children who are sharing that experience and the teens are, are they, you know, so each group is sort of separate. Um, so they have a chance to, uh, you know, work, you, you have a chance to sort of uh, bond with others, to, to realize that other people are sharing the same experience that you are, uh, and then to work through uh, a lot of the really negative emotions that surround, uh, you know, a, a parent's cancer diagnosis or, or the cancer diagnosis for the patient, you know, fear, uh, anger, a lot of those things that are really overwhelming, um, you know, and so we help the kids and the patients, uh, you know, we help the parents sort of parent through cancer, you know, we're not really a support group for the parents, whereas we're, a, you know, the, the parent component is really there to support the family. Uh, you know, no one knows how to be a parent. I have two kids. It's the greatest experiment uh, of all time is, is raising children. And uh, certainly no one knows how to have cancer. And yeah. if you put those two things together, you know, it's incredible, the, the, the pressure. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's, that's, you know, the program uses a lot of art to help, you know, if you were to try and put kids in a circle, you know, in a, in, in that kind of, if you imagine like a movie, if they had like a support program and it was just people sitting around in chairs, you know, it's not going to work very well. So, you know, we use a lot of art to help uh, break down barriers with the, ch with the children. And uh, the program has been very, very widely received. We run, we run it across the U S we run it internationally in countries like Ireland and Japan uh, as well. It's so fascinating, Gregor. And I, I remember when you and I sat down and had lunch and you, you shared with me some of this artwork and I was just truly taken aback by the magnitude of the image, the message in the image, um, re really going into that. So I love that someone within the organization saw the opportunity to license this program. So let's get into the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, right? As I like to say, let's nerd out. Let's nerd out over this. How How is the CLIMB program licensed? Can you take us through the process or hit the highlights? Because um, I know we've got amazing viewers and listeners that are likely listening to say, we want to do this we too. Do this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, it was a really good fit for our organization. And I think, uh, you know, it's it's really a <laughs> It's sort of as simple as that. Like, if it's a it's a good fit, if it's a good fit, mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that it, it couldn't become a good fit uh, with with some work if it, if it's not a good fit right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot to consider, I think, before you go into it. Uh, you know, for, for 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 me personally, I think it's really important to focus on some of the philosophy, of, like philosophically, why why do we want to do this? Um, you yeah. know, so if, you know, I, I wanted to escape fundraising. That was part of my motivation, you know. Is a uh, sure. I, I I feel more comfortable selling something. At the end of the day, really, is it, it's as simple as that. Um, but I don't think that's enough of a reason. Like, oh, we just need we wanted we want more money coming in. That, that's not really enough of a reason to jump into this, and it's not really enough of a of a not really a strong enough foundation. Uh, and I think it's really important to that that organizations that are considering moving to a licensing structure really spend time to go why why do we want to do this is this a good fit for us you know how do we know that this is a good fit um and and i think uh you know there's there are a lot of people who i mean, one of the things i've experienced is that there's a lot of people who get sort of squeamish when you start uh describing nonprofits in business terms yeah and um <laughs> You know, and that that's going to come from a lot of different places. You know, you're gonna you you will you could potentially lose uh, donors who are uncomfortable with the idea of the nonprofits uh, selling something. Um, you know, that's that's a potential that you know that's something that could that could happen. There's a, there's a lot of yeah. There's not everybody. You know, it hasn't been a big thing, but it's it's a part of it. And you need to make sure that 
you know, internally, you, the people inside your organization are comfortable with that, with this change, understand the need for it, uh, or understand the desire uh, to implement it. Uh, and you need to make sure that you, that, you know, yeah, the, the other, the other support structures that exist uh, financially, you know, your donors, your, your grant writers, that, that this isn't going to be something that's going to interfere uh, with, with that process, with those processes either. I often think it's a missed opportunity. I think there are so many organizations with phenomenal missions, mm -hmm. amazing curriculum, amazing programs, yet we nonprofit leaders rarely take that business savviness and that side to say, hey, we have something good here and it really could benefit us in long-term sustainability. I mean, for, for me to hear you say, I really didn't want to do the fundraising. I feel more comfortable selling. Like, yes, let's do this. Like, how do we do this? And I think, again, it goes back to so many missed opportunities. So you've talked about the philosophical side, um, which was hard for me to say, <laughs> and then the technical side, right? So have you, have you touched on the technical side? Because I'd like to know about how it helps you to generate these funds. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in, in our case, looking at, when you look at sort of the, the, the technical side of setting up a licensing structure, you were, we're talking about uh, developing the infrastructure to deliver something, to deliver some curriculum, product. Some, some product, right? Um, do you have that infrastructure in place? Uh, do you have the ability to create that infrastructure and manage that infrastructure? Uh, looking at uh, being able to market yourself, do you understand why your programming is is different? Like there needs to be differentiation in the market because you will be competing ultimately with other, potentially you may be competing with other um, pro programs or or just other, uh, you know, other ways that the organizations could be spending money. You know, they don't, maybe there's no other, maybe there's no direct competitor for your program. Uh, but you're still competing with for money within their within the organ the you know the partnering organization's budget, mm -hmm. um, you know. And then of course the, there's a, there's a technical side to the relationship building, sort of developing that the pipeline, uh, sort of that you know sales pipeline, if you will, of you know es establishing these connections and um, building them, maintaining them, going back, being able to check back in uh, with those organizations, uh, and then developing pricing structures, developing the contracts associated with uh, with the licensing. Um, uh, man, a, the delivery model, uh, you know, pricing is quite complicated. It requires a lot of time looking at the uh, market. Uh, you know, you, there, I think, you know, you have to be really cautious about not undervaluing yourself, which is, which I think for our organization was one of the things that was really interesting. Uh, when our programs in the past, before we had a partnership model, uh, when our I, I think you could say it was cheaper to put our programming into a hospital because the hospital was were, at that time were just paying uh, to train individual staff, right? Um, so they would say, okay, well, how many? What's the cheapest? What's the what's the the least number of staff we need to run these programs? Okay, so you know, if we said okay, three, then they would say like, well, can we run it with one? And be like, well, not <laughs> well, but maybe you know, it's not the yeah, that's not ideal. And then they would pay for one person to get trained, you know. Um, and yeah, in the end, you know, with one with one person, two people, it's hard to it's hard to even build the steam to to get those programs off the ground. Anyway, as soon as the programs became more expensive, there was suddenly more value associated with it. And so, I think it's very you have to be very cautious about under, like, you know, it's scary to ask for money. It's scary to come up with pricing. There's no you, you most likely you have you may have nothing to look at for inspiration. Yeah, you know, in your market, you may be just creating a number out of thin air, um, you know. But you want to make sure that 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 number is based on, uh, you know, the, the the most important thing. Absolutely, is that it's that you're profitable. That that amount of money is enough to sustain that program right now. But in addition to as the program grows, because as the program grows, as as you develop more licenses, almost certainly the expenses associated with maintaining that program will increase. You know, you have to invest oh more in infrastructure. I'm curious when you approach, I'm going to call them your partners, but like the hospitals, the clinics yeah. where you provide the program, how do they respond to yeah. this 
donating mm-hmm. your side as opposed to you asking for a general donation. I'm really curious how in that conversation, how it resonates with them to say, absolutely, like this is what we want to do. Right. How does that conversation go? I'm really curious because you're really oh, talking man. about versus the fundraising. <laughs> there is no one answer. There is no one sure. answer. Um, the, the, the good thing is, is that hospitals are used to spending money on things. And so coming in and, and having, um, you know, having a pitch, coming in with a slide deck and, 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 and a, a program a, that is, you know, a, a, um, a product, it, it's not out of left field for them. It's just right. different, you know. And in our case, one of the challenges is that nonprofits have tended to shoulder a lot of the load uh, of support programming. And I think that happens everywhere. You know, and I think that, you know, going back to the kind of very quickly to the philosophy of why you make this change is, you know, I believe that we, as as nonprofit leaders, we, part of our, of our uh, sort of obligation is to put the, some of the expectation of this care back to other people. So back to either business, back to society, back to, you know, through legislation, something like that, right? Uh, It'd be great if we could put ourselves out of business, you know, that would be ideal. If we were able to yeah. get other people to take responsibility for the things that we that we you know that we basically address, um, but it's not always easy, you know. And we had we've had we've had non we've had uh, you know certain hospitals who, uh, in the past, they had told us we're you know we're never gonna we're never gonna uh, run the Klein program, and it was like well why not? And they said uh, because the children aren't our patient. And so it was like well wow. yeah. I, I know wow. I, I think you should know that this is like, I think, do I really have to explain why helping the families helps the patients, I guess? But the thing is, is that a few, fast forward a yeah. few years, we're actually sort of in our contract negotiations or contract talks now with that same hospital. And the, the difference is time passed, leadership changed, uh, you know, yes. the, the, the environment around the expectation for comprehensive cancer care changed. And so... That's part of it. You know, you're going to come in some, sometimes it's, sometimes people are ready for it. They're like, this is, we're looking for something like this. And sometimes you're like, this is the first they've ever thought about this or heard about this. And, and I think that's, so, so there's really not a, there's really not one, one answer uh, for that. That is fascinating to me to hear that. Really? And then it's also like, well, duh, like why, why wouldn't you think of this comprehensively, you know, like yeah. what's best for the patient likely is an extension of who else and what other things are, are equally as important to the patient? So mm-hmm. that's so fascinating to me. It, it's riveting. I've got to um, drill down a little bit deeper with you because I'm so sure. curious. You know, hospitals generally have internal legal teams, intern, I mean, obviously internal, you know, financial teams. And here you are, a modest nonprofit. How have you navigated external help or advice for basically, you know, IP for intellectual property. How has that looked so that you could even go out and start this bold initiative? Yeah. So, so, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that I I wish I had more information on, but uh, Mm -hmm. the reality is our client program was copyrighted almost immediately, you Mm -hmm. know, like 22 years ago our client program was, was, you know, became intellectual property. So that wasn't my doing. That wasn't, that portion of it wasn't my, it wasn't, wasn't what I was responsible for. Um, the contract side of it, writing these contracts and, uh, you know, uh, and I, we, we, we're fortunate that we have a great attorney on our board who, who, you know, I'm able to work with to, to create mm-hmm. these contracts. The legal teams from the hospital, obviously they, they, they go to town on the contracts and we go back and forth and mm-hmm. until we, until we're, we find something we're happy with. Um, you know, we, we try to our best to stand our ground, uh, but obviously we're a lot smaller than, than a, a, a massive hospital system. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. Do you see that in the two years of your leadership that you have changed your approaches, your documents, the process? And then the second part of that question oh, yeah. What's the time frame when you from the, the sales to the acquisition of the program and the, the navigation to the actual licensing process? What does that look like in terms of time? Yeah, we've had uh, we've had a, we've had hospitals where it's taken a couple of weeks 
uh, and we've had hospitals that, that have taken uh, longer than six months uh, start to finish. And so it, it really it really varies uh, quite significantly. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's that I think that's quite common for the for the, you know, the healthcare industry is to is to look at is to have varied timelines like that. Other industries, it might be it might be a bit different. Um, but going back to kind of making sure that you have the reserves, like, you know, that you that you understand what you're getting into. Do you have the reserve capital before you go into this, before you start this project of are we going to try and generate revenue, programmatically generated revenue from licensing? Are, do we have enough reserves to, to last? If, if it starts taking six months, if it takes a year to develop these partnerships, are we going to be able to survive in the meantime? Right. It's, so what does that look like? Like, what would you advise an organization that wants to, you know, move through this journey, Gregor? What would you advise? Like a, a six month reserve, a year reserve? What does that What does that look like for you? You know, that's been successful. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I can give you a little bit of information on like what what it was like for us. Uh, you know, we had uh, when I when I took over the organization, we had about a just a little bit over a year's worth of reserve. If we turned off all fundraising, if we turned off all all revenue streams, we had about just over a little bit over a year uh, of money um, coming in. And it took it took. We're a really small organization, so we have two full time staff, and everyone else is contractors. Um, and we uh, it took you know I would say ten months roughly. To, to, to really go in and create all of the infrastructure, you know, uh, to develop the, you know, online delivery stuff. How do you, how do you get files to people? All, all of this stuff. And, and then to develop the contracts, the marketing materials. Um, and, and during that time, you know, we said sort of soft launches where we were already talking to hospitals. We were fortunate in that this wasn't a new program. We had people, we had organizations still, you know, we have social workers who approach us every week saying, how can we bring the, the CLIMB program to our hospital? We're, we're fortunate in that we already have a name. Right. Um, you know, and so we were able to kind of play around with experiment a little bit with our early contracts or our early uh, marketing materials uh, during that 10 months. But I, you know, I do think that it took uh, you know, it, it, it takes, it takes a little while. And then, and then once you have it and now you start trying to sell this, then you're looking at some period of time, some, some number of months before those licenses actually start generating money. And so I think a lot of it comes down to what the organization has in terms of, uh, human capital that they can apply towards this transition. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what about, how do you monitor, how do you monitor? Monitor and keep the programming consistent with this licensing. What does that look like? Yeah, that's really, really important for us. Uh, you know, we our, our program has been you know researched and published in scientific journals internationally, uh, and so we know that if the program is run as manual, like as it's as it's written in the manual in the manual, we know that the program works. Uh, yeah. But obviously, there's a huge concern where once we hand over the materials that you know yeah. uh, facilitators could kind of go rogue and make yeah. changes and we and we can't we can't uh, therefore you know we can't stand behind that that version of it because we don't we have, it may work better for all we know um, but you know we don't we don't have the research to back it up and uh, our our best approach is you know we we developed our training program um, you know we make sure that the training program is uh, deep and that it's you know there's enough knowledge checks built in um, and then uh, we also build into our program. So for our facilitators, the the, the professionals who are running these programs, uh, you know, we have like a facilitator dashboard where they they log in, they they uh, give us feedback, they they uh, you know weekly. So they run those they run those programs six weeks. So there's a you know a weekly uh, sort of reporting that they do, uh, you know, at, weekly to say this is how this week went. Uh, but then at the end of the at the end of the program as well, this is how you know, and that way we can kind of get the the. If somebody's feeling like there's a need for a change, I would rather hear it from them soon so that we can talk about it with them, or maybe we can consider implementing it, you know, program wide. Yeah. That change, maybe that's a, maybe that's something that that you know we should that, that we should uh, evaluate. But um, you know, putting those systems in place to get that feedback, I think, is really important. I love that, Gregor. Could, my... go, go ahead, ahead Julie. Could you share with us how many hospitals you are in or programs you're in? And where they are geographically, I mean, is this is this concentrated in one part of the country or has it just been, you know, throughout? I know, I know you have some international, correct? 
Yeah, yeah. And actually the program, uh, the program w was really, really successful in Ireland. Uh, and, and Ireland, you know, they have a national health system. And so mm -hmm. to get the program uh, to be approved for to, to to be run at one facility basically means you have to get uh, you know nationwide approval. Um, so the program is basically you know in in some sense is kind of written into the national health system in Ireland. And that doesn't mean it's run everywhere, but it, it's it's you know it is an option everywhere. Um, and, but that was unfortunately pre licensing, um, and so that's not something that generates revenue for us, which I think is a, a, a huge, was a huge missed opportunity uh, in the past. Yeah. Um, uh, here in the U.S., you know, we've got programs, uh, we've, you know, we've had programs, you know, all, all over the place. We, you know, COVID was, was really rough for in-person support programming. Uh, a lot of our programs stopped, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, but then post-COVID, there was so much turnover in healthcare. Uh, some of our trained facilitators who may have been running CLIMB programs at a hospital moved on, retired, uh, left healthcare. And so uh, it's we're still sort of auditing where we stand post-COVID. But with our partnerships, obviously we know those numbers. You know, we know that, you know, we know that we've had since our since our launch, you know, only really in the last couple of months, we've had uh, 17 new uh, 17 new facilities running CLIMB. Uh, here in Arizona, uh, you know, we were able to partner with Honor Health. So, you know, that's not just one hospital. And now, you know, now, now they're putting our program system wide, uh, which is really that's the hope is, you know, if it's good enough for the patients, if it's good enough for the families at, at um, you know, one facility, it should be good enough for the families at, at the others as well. Um, Amazing. You know, Jared, this has been such an interesting conversation. And I, I just feel like this could be such a foundational change for so many organizations, because we see organizations recreating the wheel, right? As opposed to going out and finding tested and true programming. Uh, I think this has been amazing, Gregor. You know, we don't have a lot of time. I think we could spend hours on this, obviously. Yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah, it's, true. It's been a lot of hours on this. Yeah. Yeah, true. It's really been amazing. Gregor De Bruel, Executive Director, Children's Treehouse Foundation. Check out their website. They have an amazing um, heat map about where the programs are and, and to talk talking about what the ecosystem of working within a family looks like. The website is children's treehouse fdn.org and you can learn more about the work and how they've done it um, it's really been an inspirational way to look at a new revenue model that is um, I think really sustainable and smart been a lot of fun to have you on the nonprofit show thank you yeah thanks so much for having me and you know I I, I love talking about it so anytime <laughs> thanks it's Gregor been I, I really appreciate you sharing. I, I believe, you know, yesterday as we talked about like the forecast of the future for nonprofits and one of our answers was innovation, you know, and I do think that while this isn't a new concept for our nonprofit sector and friends, it is an innovative concept that many do not consider. It hasn't even crossed our, you know, our brain space, our brain waves. Um, and it's time, right? It's time to, to lean into uh, these additional ways. I'm a huge fan of earned revenue. Like when it comes to diversifying your revenue model, you absolutely have to do uh, some earned revenue. Cause I don't believe that, you know, for us as nonprofits, we need to give away everything for free. We're businesses when we need to, to run these, you know, with sustainable models in mind. So Gregor, thanks for being a champion in this space. Uh, thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we have amazing partners um, as Jared introduced them this morning or at the start of our broadcast. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech, Nonprofit Tech Talk. Woo! Easy for me to say, right, Jared? Anyway, this has been fabulous, a really important message, and I think a new strategy for so many people that have invested 
so much in programming that they know works. So Gregor, it's been just marvelous having you on. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you. As we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you.